Hello? All right, we're about to, ready to, be to begin. If uh, you could find a seat, please. There's plenty in the front, as usual. All right. Well, good evening, and welcome to the Ron Landstrom Executive in Residence Program. This year's program is also partially sponsored by the Baldwin Free Enterprise Speaker Series. My name is Tim Burke, Inc., and I'm Dean of the College of Business and Technology here at UNK. First of all, if you could all please uh, shut your cell phones off or to silent, I would appreciate that. And uh, um, I think in the best spirit of, of UNK, we really uh, implore you to stay to the end. We have an amazing speaker for you tonight a student who not that many years ago was in your very seat. So please uh, stay to the end. The sign-up sheets, if you're signing up for class, will be circulated over the course of the program. And if you're using the suitable QR code, that will also be available after, after the program. This program, the Landstrom Executive and Residence Program, brings uh, business executives to the UNK campus to talk with students about best business practices, as well as our personal career paths and lessons learned along the way. This program was created as a result of a generous financial gift by Jerry Taylor, Kearney State College uh, alumnus and former senior vice president and chief financial officer for Applied Materials, and his wife, Jeannie. Taylor named the program after one of his favorite business professors, Ron Landstrom. We are so honored this evening for the first time in 12 years to have Jerry and Jeannie Taylor with us. If you would please stand, Jerry and Jeannie, we appreciate so much what you're doing. They're here in North Platte where Jerry went to high school for his 10-year uh, class reunion. Time, yeah. time six. Time six, got it. Thank you so much. And this is an annual event for us, and I, I took a moment to reflect on the amazing speakers we've had over the course of the last 13 years. And it really is one of the highlight events for our college and for the university. So thank you very much. Uh, your gift is indeed making a big difference. It's been a wonderful way to see it happen, develop and help students. Super. Thank you. And that's what it is all about here at UNK is helping students. So it takes significant planning to pull an event like this off, and many people were involved, but I want to pay particular, uh, give particular gratitude to Stacy Darvo, Administrative Associate in the Dean's Office, and Whitney Cave. Whitney is an Administrative Assistant in the MBA program and also is helping with event planning and have done a wonderful job. So Stacy and Whitney, thank you very much. And our guest speaker earlier this morning uh, met Whitney and said, oh, you're the one that's been corresponding with me. He said, you know, you ought to come down to Austin and join my team. And we didn't bring you here, Andres, to, uh, to raid our, our, great facul our great faculty and staff, but we appreciate that. So I'm pleased to introduce to you tonight Mr. Andres Translavina. Currently, Andre serves as the Director of Global Education, Recru Global Executive Recruiting at Whole Foods Markets, a 100 best companies to work for. Andres leads Whole Foods Markets Global Social Recruiting Initiative. This endeavor includes working with 12 regions to maximize social channels to source and recruit passive candidates. During his long recruiting tenure, Andres has also worked as Director of Recruiting and, institution, and Institutional Partnerships at Blackboard as a consulting corporate recruiter for Microsoft Retail and a senior consultant at Talent Plus where he worked for a, a slate of uh, some of the best, mo most recognizable companies in the country and indeed the world. His recruiting approach is based on helping candidates discover their strengths and employers find their and select top performers and their talents and cultural fit, and I think he's going to talk a bit about that tonight. 
Andres received his bachelor's degree in business administration with an emphasis in Japanese in 2001 and a master's in education and counseling with an emphasis in psychology in 2005 from UNK. During his time at UNK, Andres was a member of the tennis varsity team and served as a resident advisor, the chancellor's ambassador, Disney College program campus representative, and as a recruiter for the admissions office for five years. Andres has many interests. One is traveling. He was born in Bogota, Colombia, lives in Austin, Texas, home of Whole Foods Market's global support office. And he's worked as a recruiter in Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Just as an aside, it's so um, gratifying to welcome back uh, one of our former international students. Uh, as a side job for the last year or so, I've been working with our international education office. And when I first came here in 2001, I was sh pleasantly shocked at the international profile of this campus and the difference that international students make to our campus and to our community. And it's so great to welcome one of those students back. Andres is actively involved in the International Positive Psychology Association, the Society for Human Resource Management, and the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology. Please join me in welcoming back to campus Andres Translovenia. Oh, wow, what an intro. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. Oh, a door stopper. All right. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and Taylor, Jeannie, thank you for making this happen, and I am very honored and humbled to be here. It feels very surreal to be back on campus, uh, but it, it's very special to come back to a place that means a lot to me and to see people that I truly love, and um, with that, I will start my, my talk, but I hope that you have a lot of questions for me because I'm gonna go through this really, really quick. Um, I, I thought I would start by showing you some pictures that um, represent you know, my, my friends, some of the memories, and some of the, the experiences that I had while I, was at, while I was at UNK. On the top right picture, you see my friend Lucas Dart, who um, I had the opportunity to work with at the admissions office. And we travel around Nebraska together. I learned golf. Well, I didn't learn golf, of course, but he tried to teach me golf. Um, and I have in there also a picture of uh, Dr. Ed Scantling. You guys recognize him? I hear he's somewhere else in, in the org. Um, and I admire the the, the passion for, for exercise, exercise, right? Besides playing tennis, I, I got a little bit into exercise and it's something that has lasted me and served me for, for a long time. And the memories, the friends, and you know, the, the people that I left behind here have been a, 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 a very repulsive force for me to you know, accomplish the things that I have. And I found my first job at UNK. So I first started as, a, as, a, as an admissions counselor and recruiter, and that's a picture of our team. Uh, and Dusty, who is traveling, recruiting students to come to UNK, is there. He's now leading the admissions office. Uh, very, very fond me uh, memories. Uh, in the bottom picture, you also see our UNK uh, summer advising team. And what I learned from this team is that, and that was the first opportunity when I, when I led a team. And I discovered that leading a team was just as easy as hiring the best people. Because these guys had so much fun, they were self-managed, and it was my first introduction to, to leadership. Here's another picture that means a lot to me, and um, I am so, so happy to see Dr. Conley and Colleen. They are my family, they adopted me. And it's, uh, it's with so much love that I, um, that I come back here and I, I had the opportunity to see them. Their kids were my, my teachers. You know, these kids are a byproduct of love uh, and a couple that has emotional intelligence. You know, 
a lot of the things that I look for when I recruit leaders, I, I kind of learn from Tom and, and Colleen. So it's so awesome to, to be back here and, and to spend some time with you. And I also have a picture of one of my mentors, Dr. Pete Longo, who's here. And as you can see, he can make a lot of pancakes. Uh, and me, not so much. I, I'm not so good at the pancake business. But um, moments like that were, were the ones that you always take with you, right? And the professors at, at UNK are not just there to lecture a class or to teach, but they really become engaged into the student's life. And they may not tell you this, but I know a lot of the students will remem remember and carry those experiences fondly. So here's a picture with one of my first bosses, Mickey Mouse. So I had the opportunity to, to go to Disney to do a couple internships. And all of this was through UNK, right? I, I competed with over 30,000 students from all kinds of universities and was, was fortunate enough to, to join Disney in a couple internship programs. And why Disney means so much to me it's, it's because they have something magical, right? And there is pixie dust, and they obsess with guests. Customer obsession is one of, one of our leadership principles at Whole Foods Market, and now Amazon. And I think by, by experiencing Disney, by experiencing hospitality, I learned to, to provide amazing uh, experiences. Today, I tell my team that we, we are not in the recruiting business, but that we are in the hospitality business. I, I want for every candidate to come to, that comes to Whole Foods to leave with a very awesome impression. And most of the candidates do not get the job, because only one gets the job. But if the candidates that do not get the job leave with an experience and saying, wow, that was an amazing interview, and by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a Whole Foods shopper, that's, that's success for us. So through UNK, I also had the opportunity to travel, and I did a lot of the travel on my own during the summers. I visited my aunt in Spain, and I started to enjoy travel a lot. So, but through the program that Anne-Marie, and I saw her somewhere here, runs, Anne-Marie runs an amazing program that you should all take advantage of, right? So I, I started traveling, and I can tell you that travel is the best book, right? You can't learn what you learn by traveling uh, through any lecture or by reading any book. Uh, and I'm not talking about the kind of travel where you go and stay for three days at the Four Seasons in Mexico, right? I mean, you have to go travel and suffer a little bit, right? And uh, be embedded with the culture. Uh, struggle with a different language, uh, learn by failure, and ever since I have not stopped traveling. So I had the fortune to be, uh, to, to have worked in other places, but to also plan travel as part of, of, of life, right? When you, when you plan an experience, research shows that sometimes the planning of the experience is, is actually more enjoyable than the experience itself. So uh, I, my wife and I have the, 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 the fortune to plan this uh, every year. Uh, and there's a picture there of uh, me going to the World Cup in, in Russia, which was one of my uh, items in the, in the bucket list. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to, to have travel as you know, one of my uh, dearest hobbies. This is a picture of a very special place for me. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of Bogota, Colombia, where I was born and raised. So therefore, my accent, I'm not no, nearly anywhere from Nebraska or, or Kansas or Austin. Um, but very proud to, to, to be Colombian. And, and you know, it was, it was a journey to get here. This, this place represents uh, a lot of great things, and maybe some of you that have been in Colombia recognize this place because it's a very iconic landmark in Bogota. But this was the restaurant where my wife and I got married, 
And I always, when I, when I try to sell something, I always try to put myself in a position where the risk of failure is minimal, right? So <laughs> I brought her up to this restaurant where you can take a cable card or you can go by train or you can hike for an hour and a half. And I told her that I brought her closer to the stars to ask her to marry me. And if she said no, she would have to walk down by herself. So <laughs> she had to say yes, maybe because she was afraid. Um, but um, Colombia in the 80s, and still is, you know, I mean, I think it's improved a lot, but it's a society where there's a big gap between the, the rich and the poor, right? So as a, as a young person, you know, I grew up thinking that success meant to have more money and to, to buy expensive cars and to buy expensive vacations and to stay in nice hotels and to fly, fly first class. Um, I was very protected. You know, my mom would get really mad if I go to the bad side of town. And I was a, I was a great student. I, I was the best student in, in high school, had the best grades. But at the end, you know, that, that's, that's not so good after all, right? If you are the best at everything, sometimes you don't know what you're really, truly good at, right? Um, so uh, I, I, I didn't struggle growing in Colombia. I just grew up, I think, thinking that success meant something uh, that I went after. And I'll tell you a story of, of what happened uh, later. So my call today uh, is called Pursuing Happiness and Finding Your Calling. So it's a little bit of uh, a story about my journey in life and and 10 lessons, right, that I've learned uh, by any means. Um, I'm here to tell you that I've arrived somewhere and that I have found happiness and that I made it, right? I am just getting started and I have just learned some principles that I want to share with you. And this fist bump that says scale uh, will, will show kind of the, the moments and some of the lessons that I have found very compelling and transformational, right? Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, we can exchange pictures. You can use the, the hashtag happiness or golopers to maybe uh, include some of your own pictures. So this was uh, Colombia in the 90s. If you know anything about Colombia in the 90s, you probably will think uh, violence, a place that struggle a lot with drug trafficking, right? And I have a picture of my mom there because she's one of my my, my heroes, um, uh, she had a very difficult job, very tough job. She was an undercover prosecutor. And there was a lot of fear, fear um, because of the environment itself. Um, and some of you that have met my mom know that she is the sweetest, most loving person in the world that you would never imagine that she would not have the kind of job that she had confronting the biggest drug dealers alive at the time, right? So what I learned from her was that at work, you know, your work ethic and, and the time and the commitment that you put at work is, is, is something that doesn't get replaced with anything, right? So growing up in, in, in a place like Colombia in the 90s made us think about um, going somewhere else well, a little bit, and let's take a break. Well, things were very shaky in Colombia. So I came to Nebraska as an exchange student. Don't ask me why I didn't ask to be placed in Nebraska. But <laughs> it was one of the best things that happened to me. My sister went to Germany when she was 15. Um, so we, we got separated, right? But I do want to bring this picture because Colombia went through a transformational period, right? And if some of you have been to Colombia or plan to be to go to Colombia, uh, please, please do that because it's not the place that e e used to be known for being violent and, and you know, having all these drug dealers. Bad things still happen, just as, as bad things will happen in Austin or New York. But um, I have taken some of my best friends to Colombia. The guy that you see with the picture and his baby was one of my, it's one of my best friends, was a consultant with me that I brought to Bogota. And the first lady that I asked, please dance with my friend, 
married him, and he still lives in, in Colombia. He's done more things. He's, he knows Colombia better than I do, and now he has a Colombian son, loves Colombia. There's a picture of Steven Edmondson, one of my mentors, with um, Andres Jaramillo. This is one of the pictures that I could show. Uh, we had a lot of fun that night, and Andres is uh, one of the most successful entrepreneurs, not in Colombia, but in Latin America. If you have the opportunity to go to his restaurant in Bogota, or one of his restaurants, it's, uh, it's one of a kind experiences. The name of it is Andres Carnet de Res. And there's a picture of my mom and one of my great friends too that I made at, at Carney. Some of you recognize Shelly. She was an awesome basketball player, an all around athlete and amazing student. I also worked with Luke and, and I uh, in the admissions office. Uh, my point with this, with this picture is to, to say, you know, although Colombia used to be, you know, a, a very dangerous place, it's, it's not anymore, and I would love to take you all uh, on my next trip to, to Colombia. And that's a picture of my sister, and, and that's the same view that you saw back in the picture where I showed the, the restaurant where I proposed to Lisa. And, you know, Lena and I got separated in, in 94 when I came to, to the U.S., and it was... You know, we grew up very close. We, I, I grew up being the big brother, sort of being, being very jealous at her boyfriends. And um, when, when I had the opportunity to, to meet Lena again here in, 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 in Kearney, which, by the way, that made my decision to take a job here and not take a job in Disney or Canada. Well, Canada was ruled out because of the cold, right? But... Um, it's so special to me to, to, to say that Carney and UNK were a place where my family were welcome and my sister was welcome and my sister did twice or three times as much things that I did here on campus. She should be the one standing here and not me, right? Uh, now I come to her for advice. She went on to... Uh, get her master's. She now has a PhD. She's got two amazing kids. And she will be uh, a university president for sure, but maybe someday a president. She is an outstanding person, and, and I miss her. So, Nebraska. Uh, back in 1996, where we had a very good football team, I don't know if you recall back in the, in the time, we, we won the national championship. And that's a picture of, of me and my best friend, uh, Jonathan. And, and the reason why I say it was the best thing that happened to me is because although I wrote in the essay, I want to go to a warm place to play tennis and to you know, play volleyball with blonde girls, and I ended up in, in Omaha, <laughs> the, the kind of hospitality that this place offers and and the people the values and the friends that I made were the springboard to many more things that happened to me so uh, all of my dearest friends are from Nebraska and uh, although I did uh, play tennis for a little bit in high school and here uh, that wasn't the reason why I chose UNK in fact I played tennis for a year and and, and, I, and I quit. I, I quit because I wasn't, I wasn't winning and because I thought it was crazy to take off three days and travel and then you know, not, not have too much time to do a lot of homework that a lot of my professors here gave me. So um, it was great to, to come to Nebraska. Fast forward after college, after many amazing experiences after traveling. I ended up doing this with Lucas, going out to every high school in Nebraska. And I could say every high school because I purposely wanted to have every territory or because it was really boring to go to one territory for, <laughs> for one semester. So um, it was fun to, to, to get to know Nebraska. I, I admit that in some high schools I would walk in and 
kids would be really puzzled by my accent, and they probably hadn't seen someone that looked like me and, or that was from Colombia, but we had a, a great time. The funny thing about this picture is that I left the camera in whatever national park was that, and the next day when I was talking to the kids in, in the high school, I remember, oh, I forgot the camera. <laughs> so I had to drive back two hours to, to get the, the camera. Um, so during our recruiting experiences, you know, we also had the opportunity to recruit internationally. And, and I, I have a picture of Barb here and my sister representing the, the University of Nebraska at Omaha with some of our students in Colombia. It was, a, it was actually a very successful endeavor. And at one point, we had several Colombians in town, right? And because I love tennis, I also made it a, a point to recruit tennis players. So you would see uh, these kids from Cartagena, which is a place that it's warm, it never snows, right? So you'd see Jojo and uh, Juan just running in the snow in shorts and um, you know, really having fun at UNK, really priceless memories. It's about controversy because at one point we had seven out of the eight varsity tennis team players you know, that were from Colombia. And that actually, you know, the, the, the donors and domestic students also want a shot at being in the team. But these kids were so, so humble and they projected so much happiness. Our donors and the, the community embraced them. It was a joy to, you know, to go to watch them. So um, it, was, it, it was very fun. Okay, so first lesson. This is something that I learned from one of my uh, dear professors and mentors at UNK, Dr. Ken Estes. And I had the, the privilege to, to take his class, and it was his last class. Dr. Estes had battled with leukemia for a couple years, and then he decided to, to join back and teach back uh, and, and through the psychology team the department, and at the time I was, I was going through my MBA and had taken all the, you know, the business classes until I had to take managerial accounting, because everybody had to take that class if you want to get your MBA. So, uh, truthfully, I was not enjoying the class. I I felt that I, I someone was speaking, you know, a foreign language to to me, and I did partner with an amazing friend. Uh, from India, who was a uh, total uh, number cruncher, and he did all the financial statements, and I would just present the data. But I did go to Dr. Hall, which by Dr. Hall, is, t is he still here? Yeah, he did. He did let me pass the class, but I was honest, and I said, I, I'm not doing any of the work. My friend is. He said, that's how you will have to work in real life, you know? You have to complement yourself with other people, and do what you do best, and let other people what they do best, so you're doing great, you're gonna get an A, don't worry. And I felt, I, felt, I felt good, but I dropped the MBA program because somebody, and it, somebody told me, go take this class um, with Dr. Estes, because he's back. And I went, took the class, and fell in love with psychology. You know, it was the opposite, right? I felt that I wanted more, and you know, having Dr. Estes, and you, you know Dr. Estes, and you know the, the enthusiasm that, that he projected while he was sick, and he said it himself, you know, he said, I know I'm sick, but why do I have to act like this, right? And, and having him in the class where he was back telling the students, well, you gotta be grateful just because you're here, right? At the beginning, I, it didn't make a lot of sense why this guy was so, so happy, right? But then I understood that the, the simple fact that makes us just be here and be alive and have the things that we have is, uh, is priceless. So Dr. Estes taught the class and unfortunately he caught a bad cold at the end of December and, and, and I think he passed soon after that. But it was one of those moments that left uh, a, a lifelong long impact and me, right? And one of the things that he always said is, you know, be kind to everyone that you meet 
because everyone is fighting a tough battle. And then I realized, well, it's not about me, right? And sometimes you, you encounter people that seem re really happy, that seem to have it all together, but everybody has something that you know, they struggle with, right? A lot of the happiest people are very depressed, right? So big, big awakening moment for me. Uh, then fast forward, I graduated with my master's and I was recruited by this company called Talent Plus. And you know, remember me as a little kid thinking about cars and travel and being an executive. Well, I got what I wanted and I was traveling a lot, <laughs> more than I, than I wish I, I, I wanted to. And I was getting away from the things that really mattered to me the most, meaning my friends, my family. You, you, you end up in, in bad habits. You know, you eat really bad when you travel so much. Airport food is horrible. And you think that your best friends are your, your best clients, when in reality, uh, people don't care uh, about you too much, as much as you think they care, right? Uh, but people that are always there for you, the ones that really care, are just a, a phone call away. So, yeah, my job was actually nice in the sense that I got to stay at really fancy hotels, and, and I got to fly first class, and I got to wear a suit. Now I don't wear a suit. That's why I'm not wearing a suit today, because I did it for a long time, and it's very expensive to do dry cleaning. And, um, I was very successful, right? And, and, and I, I bought a house, and I bought a car, and another car, and a lawnmower, and uh, one of those um, snow blowers, and a microwave. <laughs> so, and then I, 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 something was missing, right? I, I realized that although I didn't have, you know, a lot of things, but I thought I had achieved, and I had you know, purchase what I thought was going to make me happy, I was missing something. And it was the connection between, between you know, my family, between something really meaningful, right? Um, so then I started a journey of understanding, you know, what, what, it, what, 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 what was it missing from, from all the, the, the success that I was having. And um, I found some, some lessons along my way through my journey through Talent Plus that have served me today and that are the fundamentals of how I recruit, how I approach, you know, talent. And, and one of them, very simple, is, you know, understanding that you can't be good at everything. Excuse me. You could be good at everything. You could. I could be good at accounting and public speaking and marketing and law, but you cannot be great at everything. That's, that's the difference, good and great, right? So, so I learned that by studying leadership and what made people successful, you could actually hone in uh, into what makes people really good at one thing, right? So understanding how to look for people's strengths and understanding on how to leverage people's strengths uh, not just in, in, in my professional life, but, you know, with your friends, you know, with your spouse. If you focus on the person's strengths rather than on their weaknesses, <laughs> you, you, you get less yelled at. So um, it's a very simple lesson, but, but a good one. So here's me in, in, in Chile, I think, and I, I am really tired, you know. I'm, I'm really exhausted. Um, Again, you know, thinking about what is, what is missing in my life. And I stumble into this, which is an area of psychology that focuses on studying what's good in people, right? Why people are healthy, why leaders are great leaders, rather than studying schizophrenia or depression. And through this book, I mean, these books were really addictive. I mean, the, the findings not just based on, on self-help, but in actual science, right? They're backed up by studies, and you could clearly see what some of these principles, if you apply them to your own life, 
could be the key to finding happiness. Um, so I made it a point to actually get really involved with positive psychology, and I see one of my, Teresa was one of my psychology professors that I adore here, and, uh, but I went after these guys, right? Um, so I went and met uh, the, the uh, Dr. Seligman, who's the founder of positive psychology, um, Dr. Chiksak Mihai wrote a book, very famous, called Flow, right? And then I understood that finding mentors and being around mentors and calling mentors for advice, and not necessarily always calling them, but following a mentor's philosophy, uh, it's, it's, a, it's one of the keys to finding happiness. So back to the mentors that I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the mentors that are, that are always there are a phone call away. And I can, I can say that with the mentors that I have here in this room because they have always answered my phone call and they have given me the, the best advice any time that I have required it. This one is a, it's a, it's a tough one because I had a very difficult relationship with, with my dad. He, uh, a guy of very high standards, very high standards. He's wired as an engineer. He was an amazing chess player. He would play chess with the Russians. He would make me do calculus homework and he would maybe struggle. And uh, what I didn't realize at the time was that he was doing it out of love, right? But we became, I mean, I, I had a, a, a tough relationship with him, but later in life, I realized that uh, he's one of my biggest heroes. Um, and I miss him, and I am so glad that he is here and that I can tell him this in person. You know, sometimes we wait until people are gone, right? And, and, and then we celebrate people when they, when they, when they leave. I, I was just watching the memorial of John McCain, I'm not into politics, but I think the guy was very amazing, great philosophy. And it's just sad to, I don't know if his daughter had the opportunity to tell him what, what she did during the memorial. Um, my point is that, well, you have your parents, the people that you love alive, you know, make, make, make sure to, to tell him. And I need to do more of that myself. Um, okay, so uh, a key moment here. Um, this guy, this book, this concept of, of stumbling into, into happiness is, 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 is the book where uh, I learned that imagination is something that makes us very different from any other animal and that money is, is not the end of it all, right? So there are studies that show that people that make you know, anywhere between 50 or $75,000 are as happy as people that make more than $150,000. In fact, the correlation between money and happiness could be negative, uh, as in some cases, the, the, the more money that you make, the less happy there you are, because then you have another problem, right? You, you have a Lamborghini and somebody scratches your car, so then it's stressful and you, know, you don't get bumped into first class, so you get really pissed off. And, uh, my point is that if you don't know how to spend your money, it's not that having money is bad, right? Making money is good, and making money is easy, by the way. You, you buy low, you sell high, and you can be really wealthy. But if you spend money on the wrong things, uh, you are not going to be happy. So there was another moment of, aha, uh -huh, I, I don't have to be, you know, keep improving my car or keep buying things to be happy. Now, on his book, Dr. Gilbert talks about I mean, the need for having certain things, right? Food, shelter, uh, the basic needs are also important to, you know, to, to have a, a happy life. So when money is not the primary focus, then you start having fun. I'm like, okay, let's loosen up. Let's have experiences. Let's enjoy life. Uh, this is a picture of my, my parents and I and Lisa just goofing around, and uh, it was one of those things where it was, it was a weight taken off your back, right? 
you have to work on experiences, have to work on spending money on things that are meaning, very meaningful, and spend more time, more time with the people that you love. You know, time is the most precious, precious thing that, that, that you have, right? In, and some of you that know what I mean understand that nobody's gonna give you the time back. No, no one is giving you the time back that you spent today, this hour with me, so thank you for that, but I, I hope it's, it's meaningful. So the other lesson that I learned is that taking risks is it's necessary and that failing, you know, remember when I was, I was protected, when I, I was advised not to go to the bad part of town, you know, not, not failing prevents you from learning big lessons. And, you know, failing is part of life. If you want to have all straight A's, well, good luck, and you may achieve that. But um, you will fail at some point, and you will hurt more if you don't get used to failing, right? Um, I have a picture there that represents me after a couple of surgeries. So Dr. Conley actually has done a couple of my <laughs> fractures, and uh, he can attest that I, I do take some risk, and, you know, Physical injury is actually, it, it teaches you a lot, right? I, I have fractured my collarbones, my legs, but when you fracture something like your finger and, and you learn the importance of, of, of your body, right? You, you learn to appreciate what you have, right? Not being able to put your socks in a certain way, it's, it, it's, really, it's really painful. Um, so even if failure means you know, physical pain, uh, I think there are great lessons that you can derive from that. The next lesson that I learned was that nurturing relationships was actually fun and was actually uh, the, 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 the best way to get connected to people that love you. And when I think about Colombia and how I grew up, right, relationships, and food and family gatherings were always a part of, of you know, our, our daily routines. Maybe we didn't have a lot of money. And if you, if you look at the studies of some of the countries that are the happiest, right? These are not the countries that have the most money, but these are the countries that you know, uh, know how to dance and celebrate soccer. And they, they have enough, but they celebrate among families. So, uh, I started to get close, closer to my family and started to get closer to my sister and I started to be, become a little bit more open to commitment, meaning not just having uh, you know, a girlfriend here and there, but maybe you know, meeting a, a girl and being open to, to, to a commitment. So I did meet my, my wife, Lisa, and, and, and it was, uh, I haven't done anything for as long as I have been married to Lisa, and so that tells you that I, I love her very much. And when I met Lisa, I was in a place where I was happy. Uh, I wasn't trying to make her happy, and she was very happy doing what she did, which is um, a completely different talk, a completely different lecture, but find someone that is already happy and just bring happiness together. And you know, today Lena gave us the gift of, of of having, you know, nephews, and my mom and my dad are over the moon with having grandkids. I did not have that opportunity, but um, I am so, so, so lucky and fortunate that you know we have we have these little ones to to enjoy for a long time. So the next lesson that I have in here is around the difference between a job and a calling and, and what it means to, to, to actually be self-actualized when you're doing something that you love, right? So when you have a job, this is a study of someone by the name Amy Worsnitsky. Teresa may correct me on this, but um, uh, Dr. Worsnitsky did a study on the correlation between you know, the job, a career, and a, and, a, and a calling. You know, when you have a job, your motivation is 
is the paycheck, right? Your motivation is, is just to get to Friday, collect the paycheck, and leave, right? When you have a career, your motivation is probably to get promoted and, uh, and to you know, get a company car. And sometimes when, when you want to achieve more than the other person, you, know, you, you, you tend to be com competitive. You throw people under the bus, right? When you have a calling, you, you, you don't have to think about Sunday, Sunday any different than when it's Monday, right? You go to work because you love going to work. You, don't, you actually don't go to work. You get to go to work. You get to go to this place that makes you happy, that, um, that satisfies a need that we all have in finding meaning in what, you, on, in what we do. So, so then I also, you know, as I was traveling, as I was learning all about happiness, I stumbled into this place in Omaha in 2008. And I walked into Whole Food Market, and I looked at the team members, and I saw how they interacted with one another, and the products, and the smells, and the cheese. And I'm like, this is Disneyland for foodies. This is amazing. I want to be a part of this company. Um, how can these people be so happy? And these are just cashiers. Um, so I made it a point to study Whole Food Market, to study the leaders at Whole Food Market, and, and to try to know, quit my, my, my traveling job and to try to seek uh, hope with market uh, as a job. So here's another lesson that I learned through this book by Sonia Lewerminsky. And on, on the book, there is a study on, on something that she calls the happiness set point. Uh, imagine a pie and you know, 50% of that pie is your happiness genes. 40% of that pie are the things that you can control, the things that you can take action on, and 10% of that pie are the things that I was mentioning at the beginning. You know, your cars, your houses, your material things. So through the study, I, I, I realized that my happiness genes were, were pretty favorable, so I probably was a pretty happy guy to start with, right? And having grown in a culture where I think happiness through gatherings, through food, through family was part of the culture, uh, you know, gives you uh, uh, an advanced, you know, foot in the, in the race as far as how happy you, you can be. But the, the, the thing that I was missing was on, on where I was focusing my energy, right? So I was focusing my energy on trying to change that 10% where if I could just change that 40% that involved nurturing relationships, being healthy, being a part of something bigger than myself, right, and, and establish meaningful relationships and controlling what I could control, then I could actually, you know, add the 50% to 40% so I could end up with 90% there, right? <laughs> so. Um, I made it a point to take action of what I could control. So I quit my job, and I told Lisa, let's go to Austin. She said, you're crazy. I am a tenure professor. Uh, this is, this, you make no sense. You don't have a job there. Um, but I, I, you have to be persistent, especially with your wife. And I persuaded her. and. We did move to Austin. We moved to a place right across Whole Foods Market. And it took, me, it took me four years to get to Whole Foods. Uh, by the way, the year when we decided to do this, uh, it was the toughest, one of the toughest years in our lives, right? The, the economy almost collapsed here. It was 2009, 2010. Um, so then we were trying to sell a house, and it was harder than it ever was. Uh, the idea of Lisa taking this sabbatical, well, I mean, professors that know or that have tenure know that this is, it's hard to leave tenure, right? Uh, and then we wanted to start a family, and Lisa and I got pregnant, and we, we lost the baby after we had announced it. It was, it was really tough. It was probably one of the toughest things that 
anyone could experience, right? So with all of that, we almost backed out. We almost backed out, but we were resilient, and we, we made the, the move to Austin. And in 2016, uh, we adopted this little guy who is now the loves of our lives. And his name is Darwin, because when I got Darwin, I didn't ask for permission. I asked for forgiveness. So I said, OK, like, what do you want to name him? We can name him any scientific name, name it. So he is Darwin in honor to Charles Darwin. Um, my point here is that we couldn't control the biology of, of the miracle of having a child, right? Um, we had to play with the cards that, that we had. And we, we, we took action on some of the things that, that we could control, right? Um, and Darwin represents a lot of happiness. Darwin represents a lot of simplicity. And you could see him on this, on this picture. He is the happiest uh, animal person because I talked to Darwin. He gives me advice. Uh, <laughs> and has added so much to, 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 to our lives, right? We, we love him like, like a child. My next lesson, almost the last lesson, we're almost out of time here, is you know, celebrate your inner child. And this picture, obviously the left picture is when I was a baby, and you could see I was, I was a pretty happy baby. And this picture was taken you know, years after all my struggles. I think on my face you could see that I, I'm, I'm relaxed, that I'm, I'm really happy. And one of the things that, that, I, that I started to do was to you know, be, be silly, to celebrate my, my inner child, to imagine, to dream, right? I, I, I interview people frequently, thousands of interviews. And I struggle when you know, a kid can tell you that they want to go to the moon and they want to become all these things. And they have dreams, and they can dare. But as we become adults, it's like, OK, I want to make $30,000 more. Really? Like, have we lost the ability to, to imagine and learn? And if you, if you kind of um, think about the best executives, the best transformational leaders, right? Uh, Steve Jobs and Walt Disney and Elon Musk, they all have this. this this DNA of being able to imagine and do things that no one has ever you know, uh, thought about doing. Uh, and you know, being, being yourself in a place that lets you be yourself is, is fun, right? Um, and my last lesson is discover meaning. And if you have read uh, Viktor Frankl, it's a, it's a book called Man's Search for Meaning, right? If this guy could find meaning in the circumstances that where, where he was in the concentration camp, no, no matter how bad your job is, no matter how bad things are in life, you can find some sort of meaning in, 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 in that work that you do. Um, now, to, to find meaning in a place, you know, if you, if you think about a company, you know, the company that offers you the things that I, that I share with you, relationships, being a part of something bigger than yourself, being proud about the products and services that you offer, and being in a place where you can be friends right, with the people that you work with, because you, work, you spend more time with the people that you work than the time that you spend with your, with your kids and your family. So why not enjoy? the people that you work with, and why not have a, a, a meaningful working uh, relationship with those individuals? And I found that place a Whole Foods Market, right? This is uh, our team today. I, I joined Whole Foods Market in 2014 as the only and the first recruiter at the corporate office. And today, this team has 17. My boss is missing from the picture. I actually recruited my, my own boss, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, and again, you know, Whole Foods Market represents to me that place that has leaders with emotional intelligence, that has uh, a purpose, that offers products that help the, the world become healthier, and that it's a place that lets me be me. And you know, th 
they love me for who I am, for, you know, some of the, the faults that I have. Um, but it's, it's fun to, to go and get to work with these guys every day. And as you can see, Darwin gets to go to work, go work with me sometimes. Um, these are the 10 lessons that I share with you today. By any means, I'm, I'm telling you, and I say this again, you know, I have not arrived anywhere, and I have not discovered the secret to happiness, but I think I have discovered guidelines that can help me in moments of difficulty, right? Um, and I hope that these guidelines can also help you in moments of doubt, right? And to close, I actually wrote a, a manifesto that could help me and help you remember some of the lessons that I learned. So I'm going to read this to you. We should be kind to every person we meet. We will acknowledge natural talent and focus on people's strengths rather than trying to fix weaknesses. Our best mentors are a phone call away, and they are and will always be available. The most meaningful things in life are free. All the lessons that I shared are actually free. They cost no money. Striving for material abundance should not only be our, our only goal. Exercise and healthy food are the best sources of natural energy. We should take risks without fearing failure, because failing down is part of life, but getting back up is living. Our true calling should be found in a place where we can become a part of something bigger than ourselves, where we can be friends with our teammates, and where we will find meaning in the work that we do every day. Lastly, individual circumstances are just a part of life. We can and should take action on what we can control. We will never live by other expectations, but instead we should embrace our inner child by dreaming big, smiling, dancing, sleeping, singing, and honoring the people that matter the most to us. Life is a, be a beautiful moment. It's, it's just a moment. And we should leave, not just exist. So thank you so much. And um, again, I am so, so honored to be here. Thank you for all of you that made this happen. Thank you. Do you have time for a question or two? Yeah. Andres, that was just amazing. Thank you so much for, for being here. We do have about 50 minutes or so for, for questions, so I will do my best to work my way around the room. Who's going to get us started? In the meantime, I'm going to take uh, a selfie. Just, and just send you have to be to patient. You have to wait them out. They will eventually get so uncomfortable, they will... Uh, there's Anne Marie. And no, no, oh. you. Oh, okay. Anne Marie. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about how your study abroad experience at <laughs> let, or contributed to your leadership abilities specifically? Yeah, there is not. I, I don't think in doing what I do, which involves interviewing people, getting to know people, sniffing people, if. if Sniffing people, you know, some people can BS their, themselves through an interview. Uh, when you experience cultures and when you get to know many people from many different cultures, you can develop that sense for that intuitive sense for people, and you know when someone is be being authentic or someone is not being authentic to you, right? Um, in understanding, so interviewing and assessing talent, it's it's. It can be difficult, right? As human beings, we have biases. And those biases come into play when we are interviewing people. Um, some people get penalized because we don't look at you in the eyes. In fact, during my talk, you, you saw me maybe just focusing on someone. But I grew up you know, not being able to look at my grandparents. And they would get mad. So don't penalize me because I don't look at you in the eye when I'm interviewing you know, with your company. And don't teach me to interview better by, by making me look in you in the eye. As a recruiter, I understand that there are different, different circumstances and people have different ways of expressing their talent, uh, which by default um, 
yields into hiring the best person for the job and not letting somebody go because you know they didn't wear a suit today. Um, yeah, so thank you for that awesome experience to travel abroad. Yeah. Um, in what ways do we limit our intake of like negativity? Like some people say to limit your um, time on social media, but like what do you do or what can you advise us to do? Yeah, uh, that's, I'm going to be pretty, pretty blunt with you. I mean, you, you should surround yourself with, with the right kind of people, right? And, and avoiding, I mean, people will complain, and some people just have a chip on their shoulder, and some people just will always be negative. And I, I think I just, I, I, I gravitate towards not, you know, being a, a part of those conversations, right? And... Um, you know, and part of the reason why I also joined with, with Whole Foods is because of the positivity, because of the, you know, I don't want to mention other grocery stores, but there's a difference, right, <laughs> when you work through, through aisles. And it's not a bad thing to avoid, you know, not everything that comes to us, especially when social media with, I mean, today you, you, can, you, you, you can learn from every source, and if you can limit the sources of knowledge and your areas of interest. Like for me, recruiting and positive psychology is it's all I want to learn about. I'm maybe dumb in other areas, but those channels help me avoid, you know, the, the, the noise. So that's a great question. Others, Dr. Conley. Oh boy. <laughs> I've been good, I promise. Um, you had a lot of books up there on positive psychology, and so if I was to pick one book to read to give me a generalized ideal of positive psychology, which one would I pick? Or can I pick one? Yes, you, you, I will give you a book that's a, a given. Uh, I think, you know, flow, flow is, it's such a simple concept that it is, it's so easy to comprehend because when you are in doing surgery, you get in a mode where you don't think about the time. You know, you just, you are in flow. That's your, you are in your element. So when you understand the science behind how to be in flow, you know, you, you have a recipe for finding more, more, more moments and, and do, do things that put you in flow, right? People that play the piano, people that run. But at work, knowing how to find the formula for flow is, I think that's a pretty good, good book to start with, yeah. Would you happen to know the author of that book? His name, yeah, I was on the picture with him. I'll see if you can say his name. Uh, Mihaly Chikchak Mihaly, or uh, Chikchak Mihaly. Like 12 uh, syllables. He doesn't, he doesn't mind, I know he, he He's a very mm -hmm. uh, humble guy that knows that his name gets mispronounced a lot. Yeah, so. That's great. Other questions? Um, on, on the note of passion, uh, you, you, you had the diagram there of the different levels in a career mm -hmm. and all that. Um, at, at the company I work at, we have a lot of software developers, and there's a pretty clear separation between those that love their job, consider it a craft, and those that are nine to five. Um, when you encounter people that are more of a nine to five, nothing wrong with nine to five, <laughs> but uh, when you encounter people like that, do you have any tips for um, getting them to take ownership of their work, to, to, to find that passion in their work, or you know, ways to encourage? Yeah, I mean, some, one of the of the things that we do when so I mean we, we call these people psychologically retired right where they're just there and they can't w wait to to go home and one of the best things that you can do for them is to tell them that it's best for them to find something else because I guarantee you that when they go home they're not the only ones that are dreading that job their kids are, are are seeing this, you know, and, and, and their parents or mom and dad, their spouse. So I think you're doing them a favor. 
to actually, you know, to, to show them the exit, exit door. And it, I've had this conversation, and I, have, I, the majority of occasions, people have thanked me, right? And maybe software engineer is something that they were told that they needed to do, and, but where their true passion was, you know, medicine. Um, so I just think that it's really hard to instill the, the, the passion and the fire in someone that is not motivated intrinsically by the job itself, you know? So it's a, maybe not the answer that you wanted to hear, but it works, yeah. Boy in the back. All right. So when uh, when you're hiring people, do you consider like uh, their performance in school over the experiences of, that they have in like work, or do you prioritize one over the other? So we we have a very unique philosophy around hiring and looking at the things that that truly really matter. So we don't require degrees, for instance, at Whole Foods because. Our CEO said that we don't need to require a degree. If he didn't have a degree, why, and he's that successful, why should we require degrees? Um, so our focus, it, it's really around the person's talent, right? Uh, if you graduated from, you know, whatever name university versus UNK, uh, which is, by the way, a very awesome university, uh, but some companies get you know, gravitate towards looking at Ivy League schools, and there is no, there is, there is no difference uh, uh, when it comes to, you know, the, the, the talent that you bring to the workplace. And I'm talking about your ability to adapt, positivity, you know, your integrity, right? And you don't learn integrity at Harvard or at UNK. You learn integrity, you know, through your parents and through the, the lessons that you learn as a kid. So it, it's more about, or we look more for those attributes um, that really matter when it comes down to doing the job. You know, showing up on time, working hard, and being happy with the work that you do. Uh, experiences and grades and, yeah, they're, they're nice to have, but they, they're not the, the first priority. Um, so work on maybe working on understanding your strengths and knowing how to tell people, you know, instead of I did this and my skill set is this, is this is what, what I'm really good at. It's, um, it's a good exercise, I think. As a global executive recruiter, I'm sure your team has to use many forms of communication. Um, what strategies have you found work best? Um, maybe globally, internationally, here in the United States, with how many different forms are out there, what do you guys feel works best for you? So the, the art of, so what I do is, is really head hunting, right? I go after people who are very happy at their jobs, who are very successful, and I try to find their phone number, email, and I, on a Tuesday afternoon, try to call them and say, hey, what do you think about Whole Foods Market? Um, so to answer your question, the best way, to, I mean, we have all these tools and we send all these emails and we have, you know, different channels and we try to get through the back door. I think the best way to do it for us is to just do it the, the old school way, right? Finding a phone number, finding someone that knows someone so you can connect with the person directly, right? Uh, I do, and I'm very passionate about all the hacking tools that, that, that uh, are out there to, f and to find people's emails, and, and uh, I, I, I think I could do pretty much anything <laughs> as it relates to that, but nothing beats also the personal connection, and when somebody hears your passion about the company, about a product, about what, what you're representing, no... AI or bot can beat that, you know? Um, so 
it's 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 human human relationship it takes more time it takes you know more effort but it's, uh, it's well worth it I think we have time for <clears throat> maybe one more question hopefully not in the very back row by the way we are in the degree granting business here so yeah stay in school <laughs> get your degrees <laughs> yeah please and, and I would have to point out my good friend and colleague uh, of managerial accounting fame in the back row, Dr. Hall. I hope you were here to hear what Andre had to say Dr. about Hall. you. <laughs> I, well, you could look at it that way, or you, you helped him onto a different path that's obviously worked out well for him. I did well in your class. <laughs> I had a, I passed your class. I just uh, didn't enjoy it that much because <laughs> it was hard to caught up with all the numbers and whatever we discussed, you know? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, thank you. again, Andres. Thanks. This has been awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. If you're joining us for dinner, it's uh, just across the hall to my right. We'll see you in a few minutes. Yeah, I hope I don't forget anything. Hey, how are you?